Welcome everyone to the Track Friday seminar, Transportation Seminar. Um, I want to introduce Chris Rayal from Transportation for America. He's the Pacific Northwest Field Organizer and will be presenting work on regional performance measures. Uh, he has a long background in, in transportation advocacy from California and now in the Northwest. Welcome, Chris. Thanks, Mary. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, really excited to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, transportation performance measures, um, but I guess it's a tradition in the seminar to give a little background on, on how one came to the position that they're in now. And uh, I have an academic background. Oh, that turned sideways. Shoot. Um, I have an academic background in um, architecture. I have a BA in architecture, and then I have a master's in wildlife management. So you might be asking yourselves, what is this guy doing uh, in an academic institution talking about uh, transportation? But um, I, uh, when I was doing my master's at, at Humboldt State University, got really involved with transportation issues on the campus there, just parking issues and, and access, to, um, access to the campus and, and um, incentives for you know, how people were getting there. And uh, it just kind of snowballed from there into working on um, issues in the community there. Humboldt County is kind of interesting. The, the, the two largest cities in the county, Arcata and Eureka, are connected by a, uh, an expressway, a 50 mile an hour expressway, and then a rail line that hasn't had trains on it since 1998. And so the safest way to bike uh, between the two cities is, is on the shoulder of this 50 mile an hour expressway. And so as a member of the public, you know, looking into what transportation planners and, and project managers, et cetera, were doing in terms of what the end result was, in terms of what we had to use, uh, there it seemed like there was opportunity to, to play a role. Um, one of the things that I find really interesting about being involved with uh, transportation issues, having a background in these other, other uh, um, fields of architecture and, and, um, and uh, natural resources is um, there's just there's a lot of opportunity for cross pollination. Any profession kind of has its silos, and people tend to kind of have their way of doing things. And it's it can be really helpful to have uh, thinking come from the outside to to think differently about how to do things. Um, in addition, um, there's also just a tendency in any any profession, particularly it's very technical, to kind of be heads head down. Uh, looking, looking at kind of what you're doing, is it running the transportation model a million times, trying to get that data cleaned up, and not spending enough time bringing your head up, looking around, thinking about what is the big picture, and is, is the work I'm doing really the most effective way that I can advance um, things and best serve the public, um, if that's who you're serving. So um, coming as an outsider, as an advocate, it's, it's a fun place to be, and it's a place where we can uh, contribute to the conversation. So um, after a number of years of, of doing work in the community there, I found myself as part of Transportation for America. Uh, been there for six and a half years. Great group of folks. A lot of, a lot of technical expertise that I get to draw from from the other folks in the organization. And uh, the role we play is really kind of being the glue to tie together folks in two ways. First of all, there's, there's folks in different cities who have really similar challenges. And um, they are, you know, they're struggling. The federal, federal policy doesn't serve cities very well. State policy often doesn't serve cities very well. And yet these cities, they're, you know, they're disconnected. And so there's an opportunity for us to connect folks in different places and help them to share ideas and, and get policy enacted that can, help, that can help them achieve their goals. And then number two, we're not an association like APTA or NACTO or US Conference of Mayors where it's all folks from one type of agency. We have universities. Uh, cities, transit agencies, advocates, MPOs, so all different types of organizations coming together and there's a lot of uh, opportunity for cross-pollination there as well. Um, and so, you know, a smattering of the types of members that we have. One of the cool things for universities that are part of our network is there's a real opportunity for researchers to, um, to connect with practitioners. Um, in, in public agencies and, and with advocates, and et cetera, and get info on kind of what um, research is really needed. And also, um, so kind of tapping that, that information, and also be able to tap practitioners to get data and get access to, to the, 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 the data they might need in order to do their research more effectively. So, um, and then on sort of the student side with universities, there's an opportunity to sort of be connected with um, 
connected with cutting edge policy uh, policy development. So um, federal, state level, and local level. So um, for for our members, it's an exciting time. Uh, we developed a um, report in February 2015 on performance measures. It's one of the issues that we're very interested in. Um, we think it's a way to uh, advance policy and try to help folks to do things better out there on the ground. And um, performance measurement, um, it doesn't, it can apply to transportation, it can apply to all kinds of things, individuals, organizations, projects. It's, you know, it's a very broad, broad, uh, broad in its usage. Uh, we're seeing it more and more in transportation. It, it's not necessarily new to transportation, but it's becoming more common in, in transportation planning. And one of the reasons is it's required now. MAP 21, which is the transportation bill, federal transportation bill that passed in 2012, is going to require metropolitan planning organizations and state departments of transportation to uh, report on all of these measures. And now here we are four years later, U.S. DOT is almost done developing the rules for exactly how they're going to do that, uh, but that's another story. So that's one reason it's required. Another reason is, is there's all kinds of, of benefits um, that one gets from uh, tackling a, a performance-based framework and using it in planning. Um, there's opportunities to um, create more transparency and accountability so that people can see how decisions are being made. Um, you can get more out of investment when you know what the results are of the different investment choices that you're, that you're going to be making. Um, it's, an, it's a way that policy conflicts can be resolved both kind of within transportation and then between transportation and other, and other sectors, other policy areas. And then it also, um, through sort of all these things, it's a way that, that agencies can make the case for more transportation funds to manage the transportation system. So lots of advantages. This is kind of the, the thing that uh, a lot of departments of transportation go straight to uh, thinking, okay, we're going we're gonna to look at performance. This is evaluation. This is a dashboard. Um, you know, having something out there online that says, okay, we're, we're managing our pavement to this level. We've, we've got this level of safety that we've achieved. Um, you know, our projects are coming in on time and on budget, et cetera. This is important. It's, it's good that it's, that it's there, um, but it's not, this isn't enough for an agency to get to garner those benefits that I just talked about. Um, what, it's, what one really needs to do is think about performance measurement um, as a framework um, and a process uh, for translating goals into investment decisions through performance measures and targets. So um, the, I think the most, the, the areas I'm going to focus on most uh, today are, are the, uh, this, that connection. How do you connect your performance measures and targets to your goals? Um, that requires a certain amount of deep thinking. And then uh, connecting investment decisions to performance measures and targets requires some deep thinking and also some, there's some politics in that. Um, so we'll get into that a little bit. Evaluation is also important, but um, it's kind of, a lot, in, in a, to a large degree, it's a, it's a matter of just kind of having the resources to do it. Um, so I'm not going to talk about that as much. Um, but um, I want to tell you, this is a little bit of a non sequitur, but I want to tell you about a, a walk I was taking at night up on Mount Tabor. Um, and I came across this guy on his hands and knees under one of those uh, street light lights, those lamps that are up there. And he's, he's crawling around. And, and I come up to him and I'm like, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> and he says, I'm looking for my glasses. And so I asked him, you know, where did, well, where'd you lose your glasses? Oh, like 30 feet over that way? Well, why are you looking right here then? And he says, this is where the light is. And this is, uh, you know, uh, this is um, actually a pitfall that, that transportation planners can fall into, that they, um, as they're thinking, okay, what performance measures can we use in our system, they go straight to, okay, what data do we have? Let's talk about data. Um, and that's, that's not the place to start because what happens is then you're, you're measuring things that aren't what really matters. Um, we, we need to measure what we value. What we value starts from those goals. So, so trying to think back, I mean, you know, does the public care that you have perfect data? Because there, you know, there are challenges. There, sometimes data is not available. Sometimes it's expensive to acquire. Um, but does the public care if you're measuring the wrong thing? Um, you know, or, or
or do they care more about whether you're going to measure the right thing, or do they care more about whether the data is perfect? Um, you know, they probably would rather have a little bit of uncertainty. This is how it plays out when, you're, when we're talking about congestion and how you measure congestion. Turns out there's a whole bunch of ways to do it. Um, the traditional measure of congestion is called the travel time index. And every year, the, the Texas Transportation Institute comes out with this report, and then you see it in every newspaper. It says, um, you know, Portland is seventh worth, worst congested city in America. And this is the measure they're using, so this will help put it in context for you about kind of how, well, I'll leave the editorializing out. Um, <laughs> um, so, so here's a comparison, Atlanta and Chicago, um, how are they performing in terms of, of how we measure congestion? The TTI, it's a measure of how fast can you drive um, at 3 a.m. compared to how, you know, or when there's no one else on the road with how fast you can drive at, uh, during rush hour. And if those are the same, you get a one. It's like a ratio. And so one is perfect score. The lower the score is the better. If it's a higher score, it's worse. Um, and here we're comparing Atlanta and Chicago. Chicago has a worse score on the travel time index, a 1.43 compared with 1.35 for Atlanta. Um, but it turns out that Chicago commutes are actually only you know, 36 minutes. And a commute, the typical commute in Atlanta is 57 minutes. So which is really doing better? Well, another semi-traditional way that, that, um, that uh, planners often look at um, congestion and measuring that is with delay. And you know, here in this comparison, Atlanta has a delay of about 15 minutes, and uh, Chicago has a delay of, of 11 minutes or so. So, okay, um, Atlanta's worse, Chicago's better. Maybe that's the thing that makes sense. But still, we're not getting it. You know, are, are we getting at what really matters? Well, here's another comparison to, to illustrate how that can be a pitfall. Um, Denver, over time, comparing 1982 to 2007, the travel time index degraded horribly. It used to be really close to one. Now it's, it's horrible. It's 1.31. The average travel time, that commute time, roughly the same, still about 50 minutes. Um, and then delay is used to be four minutes, and now it's 12 minutes, so horribly degraded. How, how is it that their, uh, their travel time is still the same, and yet you know these sort of older measures of congestion that we have show that there's been degradation? And what it comes down to is that um, these other measures take it, are kind of looking more at speed, how fast can you go on the road. Um, but what matters to people is not just how fast you can go, but how close you are to your destination. And over time, Denver, um, through infill development and, and smart growth, um, was able to get housing and, and jobs and other opportunities close enough together that people don't have to travel as far. And so their commute times are the same, even though the delay and the travel time index make it look like it's worse. And so what, what types of investments should a region make? What's the, the goal they're trying to achieve? You know, they would be very di different depending on what, which ones of these outcomes they're, they're um, attempting to reach. Now, in both of these slides, uh, there's people who are not even taken into account. If you're riding max, riding your bike, working from home, this is not, has nothing to do with you. So um, even even talking about all these measures, still not really getting at uh, not getting at really what the whole public is dealing with. And there's some there's some uh, things people have looked at in terms of measuring per capita, um, including that as an element in the measure. So there's some ways to get at that, but um, or or just using other measures that actually get at that issue in terms of mode share. Now, this is really important right at the moment um, because. As I was mentioning, those, those uh, performance measures that MAP 21, the, that 2012 transportation bill is going to require MPOs and state DOTs to uh, report on, um, they've just released the draft rule for how to measure congestion. And they have a, a number of different ways that they're proposing, and I'm not going to go into detail with those right now, but um, do want to point out that they also expanded the national highway system on which these performance measures would apply. This is Northwest Broadway um, in Portland. It's part of the National Highway System. And the measures that they're proposing would, would have Metro um, set targets for how fast cars can go on this street. <laughs> and I would think that at least the city of Portland's goals, probably our whole region's goals on, on this street, is not how fast cars can go on the street. It's probably what's the vacancy rate in these in these retail spaces and in the office upstairs, it's, it's um, you know, what's the potential for development on any surface parking lots that are a little bit further up the street? Um, 
so anyway, you know, there's, there's going to be an interesting, interesting times with that. There's about two and a half more months of the comment period on this draft rulemaking, and so that's an exciting place. Um, if you guys want to look at more information on that, that you should. There's some on our website, and, and on USDOT, they have some webinars that are about how these uh, measures work as well. Um, some other things going on um, that are of interest in terms of performance measures right now in this region, the uh, Metro, our Metropolitan Planning Organization, is working on their long-range transportation plan to be completed in 2018. But they're pretty much working uh, full tilt right now on it. It takes, takes a few years. And a big part of that discussion is what is the performance-based framework going to look like for that plan. So that's, that's another place if you're interested in getting involved with or, or, or tracking some of the local issues that are going on. And then uh, there's certainly a lot of momentum right now towards uh, a, a transportation funding uh, legislation in the 2017 legislative session for the state of Oregon. And those, you know, they've just formed a committee. Things are starting to roll on that as well. And reform of some sort will certainly be a part of that uh, transportation package. Whether performance measures are involved or not, I, I couldn't say, but uh, they could be. So um, one of the things I thought would be helpful then for most of the remainder of this presentation is to talk about some examples of places that, that we see that we think are doing a pretty good job at tackling some of these challenging um, sort of deep thinking challenges of, of how you set up a performance-based framework. And one of the places that's doing some pretty interesting work is the Metropolitan Transportation Council. This is the um, Metropolitan Planning Organization for the San Francisco Bay Area. And they um, had a really interesting take on sort of how to develop a parsimonious set of performance measures. When you're, when you're setting up a framework like this, you don't, you don't want to have so many measures that you're kind of uh, just spreading too thin uh, on, on what are the goals you really want to achieve. You want to have few enough that there's sort of a, a reasonable number, that they have achievable targets. So you have to kind of stay reasonable. So they started with the, that triple bottom line sustainability approach of looking at equity and environment and, and economy, and then thought about what goals were really associated with, with that set of values, and, and then developed performance measures from that. And one of the things that's missing from this chart is uh, congestion. They have no measure of congestion in their performance-based framework. So they don't, as they're planning projects, they don't, they don't care. Their goal is not to reduce congestion. They have some other uh, ways that they're taking it on. So they are attempting to reduce vehicle miles traveled. And they look at accessibility um, and then transportation system effectiveness. So how are they shifting their mode share so that people have other options on how to get around? So creating options and alternatives to congestion. Um, but they don't measure congestion. So that's just a very interesting case study. Another um, thing that we see going on in a few different places that, that's very interesting is the issue of, of health and transportation. There's been a growing understanding of, over the last 10 or 20 years that, that transportation has a very big impact on health. We've been measuring air quality for a long time as part of a lot of different transportation planning, um, but not looking at physical activity, which we're finding is actually a much bigger health impact of how we plan our transportation systems. So there's a few different places that are, that are doing some interesting work on this. Um, first of all, MTC, which I mentioned earlier, they, look at, they measure physical activity and try to predict that uh, with the different uh, investment decisions they, they are making. Um, the uh, Nashville MPO has been looking at health and transportation and um, included some really strong criteria for their project selection um, so that projects really had to have complete streets and active transportation elements. And they've saw, seen a total flip in the types of projects that then are coming forward to them because the, the local agencies that are putting forward those projects know they have to have active transportation in it, so they put it in there. So they're getting, they're getting a lot of really strong results. And then Puget Sound Regional Council up in Seattle has, has made a policy decision to incorporate health into their performance-based framework, but we haven't seen exactly what they're going to do yet um, with that, so how, how they're going to measure it and how, what, to what level it's going to be scored. But some very interesting work happening in that area. Now, all that I've talked about um, so far has been about connections between goals and performance measures. So how, how well have agencies been able to show, um, for, been able to 
to create performance measures and targets that reflect their goals. Um, but this other connection between performance measures and targets and then investment decisions is another uh, really challenging area for um, agencies when they're, when they're making investment decisions. So, I mean, a little bit of background on this. With, with MPOs, you know, typically the way they work is all the local jurisdictions have the projects they want to build and then, you know, the state DOT is part of that too and they, they say, these are the projects we want to do and then the, the MPO does what we call this, the stapler where they, they staple all those together and they say, this is our list of projects. So how do they make decisions about how to really prioritize which are, which are more important to fund and which maybe could be improved um, if we're really going to have them on the list. Um, and that's, that's a politically challenging thing. Um, if you're going to tell someone, you know what, no, your project is not in. So a few examples of some, some places that are doing, doing some interesting work in this area. Virginia passed a transportation funding bill in 2013. And then uh, their, their governor was unelected. <laughs> and the legislature, which didn't have a lot of turnover, um, sort of sat up and said, oh, uh, maybe we need to do something here. And so they, there was a bunch of momentum that built around building some accountability and transparency about, about how they were going to spend this, this funding that they had raised in this new transportation funding package. So they, they kind of did things backwards, but they still, they were working to, to build in some transparency and, and accountability afterward. So they developed this system in, in 2014 and 2015. They passed legislation. Um, and then in just earlier this year, they went through the first first round of this where they looked at all the projects they were going to fund and they scored every single project. This seems like a really basic thing, but actually like most, most agencies don't do this kind of stuff. Um, so they, you know, they had a variety of areas where they could score a project, things like congestion and safety and accessibility, um, environmental impact, economic development, land use. Those were the categories they used and developed some, some measures under those. They give a project a score and then they divide by the cost of the project. So that then they're really getting at return on investment. If it's a more expensive project, it better score really high or it's not, you know, or it has, you know, there's just, if you want to spend your money where, where it's going to create the most result. So, so they had this whole system. This was great. But they took it one step further. And you can go online and check this out. They mapped um, every single project. It's an interactive map. You can just click on any one of those dots and look at that uh, score chart I just showed you in the previous slide. It has information on what the project is, you know, kind of generally, generally what it's about, you know, how it's scored. So, so this is this is a, you know, if you think of a voter, you know, looking at Virginia and hearing, oh, now they want to raise our gas taxes again, and and you know, and you know, what are they doing with their money anyway? You know, you can send them straight to this, and and. Uh, would a, would a voter who's looking at this uh, be, you know, have more uh, confidence that if they were going to support future transportation funding increases that they would know that the money would be well spent? Um, I think it'd be interesting to do some, like, focus group research and polling and stuff to see, see what the case is. My, my guess is that it would be yes, but, uh, you know, maybe there's some research opportunities there. Um, uh, Metropolitan Transportation Council down in uh, the Bay Area again. They are really robust about evaluating projects. Um, they, they look at uh, measuring performance in two different ways. One is very quantitative. And so this, this chart shows on the vertical axis the, 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 uh, the, that quantitative sort of cost benefit um, value that they, they were putting on, on investment choices. And then the horizontal axis is this qualitative measure. So uh, the projects that are left of that um, left of that central central axis are kind of moving the, the region away from uh, the region's goals whereas the ones that are further to the right are effective at moving a region towards its goals or kind of creating a positive impact in more of the areas that they want them to and what what they do down there is any project that's over a certain cost they they run it in in the in the predictive transportation model and then not in the predictive, you know, not in the transportation model. So they're, you know, this is a lot of resources, a lot of, a lot of staff time to keep running this model with each, each of these projects in and out, hundreds of, hundreds of projects. Um, and uh, this is just the highway projects. So the, the blue are highway projects. 
Um, those other colors in the previous slide were transit and active transportation. And, you know, and so breaking these out, um, the size of the bubble is the cost of the project. And then, and then those ones that are way up in the upper right, those are, you know, have a very, very good return on investment because they're high and they are doing a good job of moving the region towards its goals because they're further off to the right. Um, and just, just to point out what some of these projects are, because it's kind of interesting, the, those really high performing highway related projects, they're the intelligent transportation system type improvements, ramp meters, that sort of thing that are helping to maximize the use of your existing infrastructure. And then congestion pricing. And if you t look closely at this, there's a little break in that vertical axis. So those are, you know, the ITS is a 15 cost benefit ratio. Those other ones are at 45 and 59. Congestion pricing, worth looking at. <laughs> um, so uh, what do they do with this? They've got this information. They know which ones are high performing, which ones are kind of doing OK, and which ones are doing not so well. Well, they, they break them out into those three categories, and they, they have different um, treatments for each of those. those. Those projects that are really high performing, and some of those examples are that, that ITS type freeway improvements, some of their transit improvements were particularly high performing. Um, they make sure that those get funded right away. So they prioritize them for funding. The, the ones that performed well enough but, you know, weren't particularly excelling, they just, they keep those on the list. So when they're making, using that stapler, those still get, get stapled on there and are part of the plan or part of the, the funding program. And then there are some projects that were really low, low performing. Uh, the one, the examples here are SMART, that's the Sonoma Marin area rapid transit, which is a commuter rail in a suburban area. Um, if, if you're familiar with that area, uh, you know, freeway widening. So um, these sort of rail improvements in low, low density areas. Um, and for those, they didn't just take them off the list because it's, it's really important that um, when you're using a performance-based framework to not just treat it as a black box. There's, there's judgment that comes into any decision and, and um, it doesn't necessarily make sense to just kind of blindly, you know, use a system but then, or set up a system and then blindly use it. So, they uh, have something called traffic court. <laughs> and they, they look at these projects and they, they have a more in-depth discussion about these low-performing projects to see, you know, should they be funded, should they not be funded, is there a way we can, we can improve them? And so uh, with, the, with the, the project in this particular round that this, this case study is talking about, some of them were withdrawn. They realized they were probably never going to be, um, never going to be, um, you know, high performing enough to, to receive the, the funds that they're distributing through this. A lot of them were, were rescoped in some way so that they could still build the project. A lot of those, they, you know, the local jurisdiction said, you know what, okay, we can't have your money, but we're just, we'll just fund it with our own, our own money. It's important to us. Um, and so they just went ahead and built it anyway, but at least the regional money that was, you know, there wasn't used for it. Um, you know, and then some other changes to sort of make some of those fundable. Um, and then, and then, actually, the issue of, of equity was was an issue there too. If you have areas there where there was historic underinvestment, sometimes it, was, it made sense to invest in these projects or keep them on the list anyway, um, because these are places that hadn't, you know, historically hadn't hadn't gotten investment, and so there was an, there was this other compelling case for why they should be invested in. I think. Um, and so, you know, what's kind of cool about this, I mean, you see it already happening here in this projects being rescoped, where um, projects are changing. The local jurisdictions are realizing they have to raise their game and come forward with better projects if they want to get funding. And so, not only does the, the framework help you to pick the better projects, but it creates an incentive for the people who are bringing projects forward to you, if it's an MPO looking at local jurisdictions that bring forward projects, it gives those local jurisdictions an incentive to develop really smart projects that are really in fitting with the regional goals. So one last story. This is uh, um, Puget Sound Regional Council. Um, in, the la about, uh, in the last few years, they really started to rework their, their project selection process for their Metropolitan Transportation Improvement Program, or MTIP, um, to to develop a constrained list of which projects they were going to fund. They had typically done the stapler um, where they just included all the projects and they wanted to be more realistic and, and think about which projects should really be on that list and if there were kind of some dinosaurs, old projects that had been sitting around for a long time that weren't getting built and 
you know, and maybe didn't fit the goals of the region um, that they could have a discussion about getting those off the list. So they went through a really difficult process, and this is the this is the Transportation Policy Board um, that um, you know that had to make those decisions. Those are those are elected officials from local jurisdictions who, some of them, their project might be getting taken off the list. So this, this is politically challenging, right? At, they did get through it, and they, they got it done. And uh, Claudia Balducci, who's uh, depicted here, she she's the former mayor of Bellevue. She was the chair of the Transportation Policy Board as they went through this process. And on her last day uh, chairing this committee, you know, she, talk, she was talking about her accomplishments as, as chair, what she was most proud of. And she talked about this project prioritization process as one of the things she was most proud of. She's a rising political star in, uh, in the Puget Sound region. She just got elected to King County Council. Just a lot of momentum behind her. So there is a, possib there is a way to turn this into a political win, um, but I think it takes a certain amount of um, education and having elected officials who are kind of smart enough and get it and can be, can be educated to a level where they understand the value of it and can sell that value to, their, to the voters and kind of help them to understand it too. So that's what I have, and I'm happy to take questions. So I think now I'll let you lead the Q&A, and, and um, for the students, please just announce your name and your program. Great. Is that okay? Yeah. Well, it sounds like a lot of these metrics they use are very regional-based, and that it's not necessarily expensive for like a, how, like if they're going for federal funding or uh, funding bigger than the region, how do they, if everyone's metrics are different, how, I don't know, how does the federal government judge which ones are worth investing in? Yeah, I mean, that's a challenge. So that, so um, MAP 21 had those, that list of, you know, 12 measures and there were actually multiple measures under some of those. Um, so there, the, so metropolitan planning organizations and state should be required to report on those measures. Um, but they do have the option of using other measures as well. Um, when it comes down to it, the, the federal government, you know, they give a set amount of funding to the state, and then a set amount of that goes to each MPO based on population. So ultimately, the MPO already has that money, and it's kind of up to them how they want to spend it. Um, so I think that there's a, there's a desire from the federal government to have some kind of accountability, um, but there's a value of local control as well that's pretty runs pretty strong in at the federal level. So um, I think knowing that there's some form of accountability is is something that a lot of uh, members of Congress would be pretty comfortable with. Eric, um, greenhouse gas emissions, local emissions, that can be a little bit of a proxy for congestion and delay. Have you found that where, where that goal can lead to some kind of short-term road widening, I mean, uh, improvement of flow, and actually induce some traffic? Do you know what I was getting at? Yeah. Have you found that to come back in when, even when they get rid of delay, like in the Bay Area example, do, do they end up trying to solve delay under that rubric? Yeah, I mean, I don't. I think that, that that's been something that you know that a lot of uh, um, I don't know how many planners so much, but a lot of decision makers have sort of like you know taken that approach that if you you know if you if you ride wide roadways, traffic's moving more smoothly, you reduce it, you reduce emissions, but then in so doing, you you're, you could induce traffic, and then you know that that capacity fills up again, and then you're really just increasing emissions. I think when you're using a, a metric like uh, vehicle miles traveled and you're just trying to reduce that, you can get at reducing congestion or, or eliminating congestion because you're reducing the number of cars on the road, but you're not expanding the road. Um, so it, it just gets right back to like you know measuring what what the th measure the exact thing that you really care about, um, not not the thing that will get at it uh, indirectly, if you if po if possible. Meaning? Uh, I actually have two questions. For one, uh, a comments on kind of the, the goal-oriented um, design or application of performance measure 
Uh, I certainly agree with you that we should measure what matters instead of what's convenient to measure. But I think what gets us uh, to where we are today, I think it, in a sense, probably is still largely an attribute to what people care about, right? So engineers, uh, or at least traditional transportation engineers, still probably have been very heavily focused on congestion, mobility is the concern, and that, that's why they, they're so focused on measuring delays, congestions, uh, TTI, and, and so on. So that's probably uh, still not an issue that a better performance measure by itself or by themselves can address, still kind of the ideology, the, the, the shift of paradigm from a mobility to accessibility that, that probably still a, a, I think, a bigger issue than a, a better performance per se. But relatedly, uh, kind of still along the line that if, uh, in terms of kind of not thinking about the data or how we can uh, come up with the information we need to do uh, per, uh, to do better performance measure, well, what what are in your wish list? Uh, performance measure that you, you like to see you kind of from your experience working with uh, different agencies, different uh, local and, and uh, jurisdictions, what are the needs, where are the needs that haven't been satisfied yet? Okay, so I'll, I will respond to the comment first. So yeah, I think, so that, that diagram I showed that was kind of a circle of you know, starting with goals and going to performance measures, then investments, decisions, then um, evaluation, and then back to goals. So you know, I think you're right. You know, we've had we we have had the goal for a long time of reducing congestion, but you know, when you go full circle and you evaluate and say, okay, this is what we ended up with when we set that as as our goal. Um, was this what we wanted? You know, would you rather live in Portland or Houston? You know, like, and some people would rather live in Houston. So you know, there are places where. Uh, you know, that's, that's kind of the lifestyle that people want and, and that's what they want to measure. There are trade-offs to that. Um, so yeah, so I, but, I, but you're right, you know, for some places congestion, reducing congestion is a goal. There's just, there are, there are trade-offs and uh, implications if you set that as a goal versus other ways or, or looking deeper at why it is that we would want to re reduce congestion. Um, the second question, examples of some uh, helpful measures that, or approaches that places have taken. Um, I mean, there's, I think it's really important for any region to really just think about what, what they care about the most and have that discussion. Um, but there, so it can be different in different places. I wouldn't say there's this one way that's the best way. But I have seen some, you know, some examples of, of measures that I thought looked, were intriguing and compelling. One is this idea of um, per capita congested VMT. So the idea that you, um, instead of looking at delay, delay is a comparison of, it, you know, delay can compare how fast you drive at 3M is like over the speed limit, you know? And then, uh, and then it's, you know, oh, I had to go to the speed limit. That's delay. <laughs> um, so congested, the idea of congested VMT is the idea of how far you have to drive and stop and go traffic, which is kind of like, you know, if you're looking at your, your Google app and it's the red, that's the part that's, bad, right? So looking at that as the worst congestion, that's the part that really makes people nuts when they just come to a full stop. How much do you have to do that? And how many people are exposed to that by looking at it per capita VMT? Seems like a really intriguing way to get at the, the frustration of congestion for people, but also get at the fact that people can opt out of it, how many people are really being exposed to it. So uh, I don't know, that's at least one measure I thought was particularly compelling in terms of a way to get at it, besides just not looking at it and looking at vehicle miles traveled or some other accessibility. Measures. One thing we've been hearing a lot about is uh, bottlenecks on the freeway and impact on freight and things like that. How could maybe those be addressed with some of the performance measures? Yeah. Um, so this is there's one of the things I think is kind of interesting in the freight realm. And this is. I don't know if this is exact answer to your question, but but uh, is the, um, the issue of reliability. And uh, you know, what do you consider reliability to be? I think most people think of reliability, and that's what's really important for freight, right? So they, you know, they send their trucks out at, at 
what's the last time during the day they can send their trucks out? And right now, I think it, you know, I've heard something about it's 1 p.m. If they send them out later than that, then they're going to have to pay overtime for the drivers because they're not going to get back because uh, they'll get stuck in you know the late in the day traffic. So reliability is kind of that um, how how predictable is the congestion? Is it going to be you know over the course of the year you know on any given day? Do I, you know, do I know I need to allow 40 minutes and I have a 90% chance of making it there? Um, so that's, um, that's an interesting issue. And in this whole um, US DOT rulemaking, they defined reliability, uh, as far as I can tell, more as, as a, just a congestion measure instead of a reliability measure. And then they're just calling it reliability. So uh, there's some challenges with kind of helping folks to understand that. Um, yeah, the bottleneck issue. I think of that less as a performance issue and more of like an issue of, you know, those challenges of how you manage like kind of traffic modeling, which I don't have much expertise in at all, but the idea of you remove a bottleneck in one place, one can form in another place. So uh, just thinking strategically about uh, doing that. Hopefully, you know, when you're doing it, it's, it's not causing those sorts of just changes that don't necessarily make an overall improvement to the whole system. Uh -huh. Um, I'm just curious, working, I see you work with Atlanta, so I'm just curious, maybe you could talk about the top one or two um, issues, measures. I say you work with the Metro Chamber. I've worked with them before um, when I lived in Atlanta doing some work. I'm just curious about what's going on in Atlanta. I mean, I already know what's happening in Atlanta. <laughs> I'm sure yeah. you know, um, but maybe talk about it because it's a little different than maybe what's happening here as far as, even though we are getting more traffic, Atlanta is other problems as well, so. Yeah, so I mean, the biggest thing that happened in Atlanta recently was the failure of the t splost uh, funding measure, yeah. yeah. So besides having the worst acronym name ever created, <laughs> um, you know, they, they, the way that they, the way that they put that package together was very much the stapler. They went and talked to all these, you know, high-level elected officials said, hey, what projects do you want in this thing? You know, what's going to take what's going to take for you to support it? In the end, they had this hodgepodge of projects, and the public looked at it and said, that's you know, like the smartest list of projects you could put together. It looks just so political. You know, it was just transparently political. And then, you know, and then the voters said no. So, you know, I think in my mind, that was sort of the, one of the biggest challenges they're facing. They, um, but what's another interesting thing about Atlanta, just going back in history, their, their transit system actually came from Seattle. Seattle, you know, is going to the ballot in November uh, for big big tax increases to expand their light rail system. And they had they said no back in the in the 70s um, to transit funding. And now they're, you know, now they're having a big freak out. And, you know, unlike almost any other place in the U.S., Seattle has the highest uh, transportation ranks, the high, like a top priority, which is not the way it is in most places in the country. That's how the transportation challenges they're facing are to that level. And they're, you know, so they're voting for really big tax increases to do these huge transit improvements. Atlanta has that transit, but they also have a lot of uh, low density development that makes their transit not as effective as it might be otherwise. <laughs> so go figure. <laughs> Thanks. <coughs>
So how well they're going to be able to have a more robust um, system for, for picking projects in this next RTP and then how that will apply to, because that's just the plan. And then it's the, it's the funding program that comes you know, two years later, the, the, uh, the uh, Metropolitan Transportation Improvement Program that sort of has the, the, the actual funding plan. So um, it will be interesting to see sort of how that plays through and whether there's going to be a more criteria-based, performance-based project selection. Now I will continue with online questions. A another question that's somehow related to my question before is what are some of the performance measures that are 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 kind of are in need but it's hard to measure where are we supposed to can invest some effort to gather data to or to some research power to try to track. Yeah, um, so where, where, where are we lacking data in terms of uh, performance measures um, that we would like to have? And I think active transportation is probably the area where that's the biggest challenge. Um, just we don't, we don't have a lot of information on where people are biking or walking and how much time is spent. And then, you know, there's both. So there's those two sides of that, right? There's the evaluation where you can look and see, okay, um, this many people were biking and walking. Um, that's... That's not as hard, but in predictive modeling, so looking at the transportation demand model or whatever model is being used to predict, okay, if we if we if we use this project or this suite of projects, you know, what's the result going to be? Um, we're you know we're we're weak on most regions have a lot of trouble with that, and then you know and then there's different choices of what kind of travel demand model you're using and how powerful that can be. So there's activity-based models that are more powerful. I'm not an expert in this, but this is what I'm told. Um, that are more powerful and able to tell a little bit more about the decisions people, individuals are making. But that's that's a that's an area where we've, we've got work to do for sure. Yeah. I'm Judy Wilson. I'm with the Urban Sustainability Accelerator at CSU, and this isn't really my field, but a follow up a question on that, a follow up comment, and then a question. Just that I, I was reading recently about research on bicycling and how unhealthy it can be at certain times of day. Uh -huh. um, when I come and go during rush hour and how unhealthy that can be. Yeah. So, you know, that has to at some point factor into the measures, I imagine. When you so you're talking about exposure to, exposure to poor air quality yeah. when right. you're, you're undergoing physical activity. I was thinking um, about that. That's not really my question. It was just a comment. Yeah. But my, my question was, I was very interested in the Bay Area doing this. I think you mentioned they ran it through two different models or one model and then a comparison. I wondered how common is that where you run it through two different models and then compare it. It's not common. Yeah, well, there were two, there's two things they did that were not common. And it's a question about um, MTC and, and their, um, their robust project selection process. So there's two things they're doing that are not very common. One is that cost-benefit analysis where they're running each, each uh, project in and out of the model and then looking at you know, what that impact is. Um, so that, that just takes a lot of resources. So a smaller MPO is going to be really challenged to be able to do that. And one way to get started is to just take the most expensive projects, you know, take a limited number of them and do it for those so that at least you're really evaluating your biggest investments. Um, and then the other part isn't common either, which is, you know, kind of look at it both those ways. There are things that are hard to quantify, but you can still score them, um, you know, and it might be somewhat subjective, but just trying to score them, are they, are they moving the region forward or backward on the, on the, in this general issue? Um, and I don't, there's not a lot of places doing that either. So it's, it's pretty unique what they're doing. And it's taken a couple decades for them to build up this process. You know, they started much, in a, a much simpler system, and they've gradually built it up to be what it is today. have a lot of the example of essentially a, a, a say MPO or a public agency kind of spe spearhead a innovation in performance measure, right? That, that's certainly a very good thing. But on the other hand, uh, in terms of, you know, rather political context uh, where different agencies are not necessarily collaborating, but they're essentially fighting against each other and that they are 
places where essentially agencies are trying to stop some of those supposedly better goal for sustainability, for a better uh, quality of life, and so on. Do you see any kind of way to try to address that issue where the either the, politi the politics or bad politics make the application of a comprehensive, a better performance system in either feasible or very hard to Yeah, okay, so the question is bad politics and kind of uh, um, differing, differing views. So, so there's, there's two things going on there, I think. There's one, I mean, if it's within one um, area, so you're talking about maybe two different state agencies, right. theoretically there's the legislature and governor overseeing them and they can agree on a set of values and you know, bring them to the, to the table together to develop a set of you know, measures that they agree to. And that's part of that whole idea of resolving policy conflicts you know, within transportation and between transportation and other, and other uh, policy areas. Um, but there's another challenge, which is um, the, you know, a conflict between a state DOT and an MPO. And there it's a different set of decision makers, right? The state legislature and the governor are, are overseeing the state DOT, and then it's a set of local decision makers overseeing the MPO. They're not the same set of people. Um, and that's... Uh, that's just straight politics, you know. I mean, we're, uh, our organization is very, very more oriented towards the local control um, sort of uh, value, but uh, but that's yeah, that's a place where you yeah, there's not there isn't really a performance measure to answer that. That's just a political answer to that. Um, you can you can go ahead. Um, I'm wondering about the scale. I mean, you mentioned you VDOT was project evaluation, MTC project. A lot of this could be regional plans. Um, you showed Broadway, and there were these kind of intersection level of service or street segment level of service. Has anyone, and you mentioned some, but has anyone actually tried to translate these bigger goals into a kind of facility level of service measure? I'm guessing they have. I don't. I'm sort of not. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with the place that doesn't know. I'm guessing some probably have. That is a, So the issue is of scale. Is is um, you know at what scale are you using the performance measures? And and that's actually a really interesting uh, question that is being um, looked at in the development of the of Metro's regional transportation plan. A lot of times you'll make a decision to fund a project. It's such a small project. It's not going to affect how much uh, there's a shift in mode share over the whole region. But if you're looking just in one corridor, um, then you can see what that result is and you can get a sense of what the return on investment is. So there, it's, it makes a lot of sense to try to think about ways to look at different scales. And that's going to be something that, that Metro is grappling with. And I'm interested to see where we, where we go with that. So that'll be interesting. Thank you.